you're about to experience, Jackson Snyder presents. Direct from the Vero Essen Yahad, a Hebrew Nation radio original program. JSP is a variety show seeking out Jewish and Christian origins, religion, theology and history, and doing so in a fashion that is both educational and entertaining. Welcome to Jackson Snyder Presents. I am so glad to see you today. Welcome. In the name of Yahshua, I wish you welcome. Yes, it's great to be with you again today. Uh, Jackson Snyder here. Today I have part one of a telephone call that just came up last night from our brother, Marion Spell. We're talking a little about life and death. And I use this recording by permission. If I can talk to you, I would love to. Let me know if you're free. Go to yahad.me, Y-A-H-A-D dot me. Tell me who you are. Let's make a date. Let's talk. Or you can give me a call. 321, that's the area code, 421-9266. Now, here's Marion and I on life and death. Hey, Marion. How you doing, brother? I'm doing okay. Um, can you hear me okay? Oh, yeah. I haven't heard from, from you for, what, two or three years? Something like, well, it's probably been longer than that. I think the last time I talked to you face-to-face, -face, well, not face-to-face, -face, but uh, voice-to-voice -voice was on your radio show. Yeah, that's true. What's eating you now? Well, you know, a lot of things are eating me, but uh, I just wanted to know... Um, you know, I, I don't want to keep you longer than, you know, is necessary to ask a couple of questions that I'd like your input on, but um, do you, do you have just a couple of minutes at least? Sure. Okay. By the way, I'm recording this call if you permit me to do so, because I always record my calls because I go back and reference them later on. Uh, that's not a problem. Okay. Uh, as, as long as, you know, as long as you understand that uh, I'm coming to you about this because, uh, I think you might have some insight that uh, I don't or that you may have some knowledge that I don't because I remember you used to you used to look into a lot of stuff that not the you know a lot of people in the common everyday religious life don't, they don't necessarily look into it. Right. Well, anyway, I'll just jump to it if you don't mind. No, go ahead. But uh to be to be honest with you, that's kind of rude. Um I guess I'm just trying to hurry up because I don't want to I don't want you to feel like yeah, uh I'm no, no problem monopolizing right. your time, but I guess the appropriate thing to start with would be how are you? Because I, you know, I've seen your posts on Facebook every so often, but you know, I, I never really took the time to really stop and consider how you've been doing after all this time. Because I'll be honest with you, I kind of fell out of the faith. Uh, not to say that I don't believe anything anymore, but I kind of fell out of practicing the faith uh, a while back. And a lot of friends that I had from, like, when I was in the Hebrew Roots Movement or considered myself to be in the Hebrew Roots Movement, I kind of lost touch with a lot of them. Some of them I still see the posts that they put on Facebook, but I don't really actively talk to them anymore. So uh, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. I've uh, got the same physical and me uh, medical problems as usual, and they've kind of, you know, they're just progressing, progressing. Now I'm having a real hard time walking because of blood flow. So I'm looking into going in. I've had uh, numerous stents put into cardiac arteries, but oh no, oh I've had 17 stents in there. And they're going to put some in my legs now, hoping that that will alleviate my walking problem. But I've been dealing with this for a long time. I'm I'm very happy and I feel blessed every day to be alive. How about you? Well, uh, I'm doing okay. I really don't have any major complaints. Um, now. Are, are you on a blood thinner or anything like that? Oh, yeah. A lot of different medications, probably 20 of them. <laughs> but I've, I've been on them for probably as long as you've been alive. <laughs> so it's nothing new. Everything's right. fine. Well, okay. I mean, I know that's a tough position to be in. Um, you know, I've, I've had, uh, you know, family members who've had uh, coronary artery disease and yeah. things like that. And it's a very tough situation to be in. And, uh, so, you know, I can't, I can't obviously know what you're going through firsthand, but uh, I do feel for you. I got plenty of help, so everything's just fine. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear if that. If you take up praying again, you can pray for me. 
But sometimes a person needs to just walk away from it for a while. I can understand that. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I, I had a couple of things I wanted to run by you and, uh, you know, just get your opinion on it. Shoot. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm going to ask you a, a simple, direct question, and I'm not going to, like, this is not to start a debate or anything like that, but uh, it's something that uh, I'm just kind of working through for myself, and I'm looking at a lot of different angles, and I've done this before. This is this is kind of the one question that's always been at the back of my mind. I talked to you about that the last time I was on your radio show, too. And that question is, do you believe that humans, that is everybody on Earth, have an immortal soul that consciously survives the death of the body and then goes somewhere. No. Okay. I don't, I don't really believe that either. Mm -hmm. I think that the Old Testament is pretty clear and the Hebrew Bible is pretty clear that, you know, the spirit is the breath of God that he breathed into Adam because, you know, uh, the Hebrew word ruach can and does refer to breath and it's a life giving force. And I don't believe that it is necessarily conscious and, that when it departs, your body returns to dust, and at that moment, there is no living soul. The soul is not an ethereal essence. It is the person themselves. Yeah, that's and exactly that's right. why we. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why we have so many verses telling us that not only the dead know not anything, but in Sheol, where you go, there is no knowledge of wisdom. The dead do not praise God. They do not remember God. They cannot celebrate God because they're dead. They're dead. Exactly. Exactly. I'll just add something to that. I don't think that the majority of people, when they're born, even have spirit. I think that has to be reborn. I, I call these people uh, spiritless humans. Right. If if the person had a spirit, why would they need to be born again? I have a long understanding of this somewhere on one of my uh, presentations that makes a lot of sense, but it's like trying to count the angels on the head of a pin. Can't do it right. in five minutes. So, yeah, that's what I think. I think when you're born again, the spirit that Adam lost comes back in, and that's one of the things that marks you as a worker in the upcoming millennium. Right. Well, um, now, I would I would respectfully, like, I don't, I don't want to debate the topic. I would sure. respectfully disagree uh, in the sense that, you know, the Old Testament in Ecclesiastes, I think, chapter 3, Mm -hmm. um, in Genesis, I think, uh, I'm not sure what chapter of Genesis it is, but anyone who ever hears this can look it up for themselves. Um, everything that is alive is only alive because God has given it a life-giving force. And I think that the Spirit, you cannot be alive unless you have the Spirit of God in you. I mean, in the book of Job, it says that if he were to gather to him, and it doesn't make a distinction between the righteous and the wicked. Um, one of Job's friends said that, you know, if God were to set his heart on man... And he were to gather to himself, that is, God gathered to himself, his ruach, his breath, I mean his spirit, and his neshama, his breath, all flesh would perish together at the same time. But, I mean, I don't want to get into debate on no, that, no. but I wanted to really get down to the, the nitty-gritty of asking is, uh... We don't know anything. There's no use arguing about these things. We just have to be settled in our own minds. There was a guy, his name was David, I can't remember his last name, uh, he was connected with you in some way. I think he, uh, I'm not sure if he was actively connected with you, but he, uh, uploaded some stuff on YouTube about a document known as the Nazarene Acts of the Apostles or the Recognitions of Clement. Oh, you know? yeah. I know who you're talking and, you know, about. I'm sure you know about, of course, the Ebionites and, uh, you know, some of the earliest followers of the Messiah. Yeah, Ebionite is a heresy for various reasons. But yes, I know who you're talking about. You're talking about I do remember him uh, mentioning some of that so, that in some of his videos. Uh, but now I just wanted to ask you if you believed that the recognitions of Clement was an inspired, maybe not an inspired document, but if it actually did follow what Peter of the time taught. The fact is, I don't know. I like to believe that. You see, in recent days, in the last... 15, 20 years, there have, that book has taken on an entirely new understanding <coughs> by some of the top scholars. Packed in there are a number of the basic early, early doctrines of the actual Messianic movement. That uses the same source material as the Acts of the Apostles, but with a lot a different spin. So I would understand that to be just as inspired as the Acts of the Apostles. 
insofar well, as insofar as what I say a salvation history more than an actual factual history, and that gives it just as much importance as if it were an actual historical document. So I'd have to say yes, most of it I believe. I don't really know what to believe concerning the document. I mean, through the internet, you have access to almost anything, but I don't know necessarily the trustworthiest sources to go to to find out a lot of the information that I would like to know. But when it comes to the recognitions of Clement, and I'm just going to throw this out there, and I'm not saying that I believe this, I'm, because I don't think that the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, I don't think it actually supports this notion, but Peter says outrightly that every person does have an immortal soul, and he does make reference of the place of torment that the Pharisees believed in in Sheol. Yeah. Uh, of course, in Greek, you would call it Hades. And he does make reference of, you know, eternal torment in Sheol. And uh, he says, you know, uh, now what are you going to say to me, people? Are you going to say to me, you terrify us, oh, Peter? Uh, but, you know, how can you, you know, how, and then he goes on to say something, that I think, if I'm not mistaken, about, well, you know, would you rather be terrified or would, would you rather know what's true or something like that? And I could be misquoting that. It's not an exact quote. But um, when we were, when me and a friend of mine, her name is uh, Yasmin. I haven't talked to her in a long time. Yasmin? Um, I yeah, think, Yasmin. She was from Canada. I, yeah, I think I, I know who you mean. Sure. Yeah. I haven't either. We were, yeah, we were watching, we were watching David's videos together. And she always kept an open mind. So she didn't really, and, you know, she believed that, you know, that she had a strong relationship with God. And, you know, obviously I would never say anything uh, to counter that, you know, on anyone who uh, says that because I'm not, I'm not a judge of that kind of thing. But we were going through, uh, you know, David's videos as it related to the Nazarene Acts of the Apostles together. And, you know, anything that came her way, you know, she, uh, I think she had the opinion of, uh, and I respected her a lot. She had the opinion that you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yes. And, you, you know, you kind of have to take care a little, there a little, you, you have to sift through for the truth. But whenever it came to that point to where Peter told Clement and the, those who were listening to him that, you know, that all people do have an immortal soul and that what, you know, and Peter makes the case that I don't necessarily agree with this, but Peter makes the case that without an immortal soul, there could be no justice because, you know, he says if people don't have judgment rendered on them in their lifetime, then they would have judgment rendered on them in the immediate afterlife, which is what most Christians today uh, believe in a conscious intermediate state between bodily death and bodily resurrection. I personally don't, but, um, I just wanted to get your take on that and whether you thought that, you know, uh, you know, whether someone was, someone wrote this down because they thought this is what Peter said, whether it's an actual account of what Peter said, or whether someone was, you know, putting in their own traditions into mm -hmm. a story that had been passed down from maybe someone who actually did hear, you know, this preaching of Peter. Well, I think uh, on that regard that it's like any other speech in the New Testament. No, they're not historical. There are reworkings in almost novel form in order to help people to understand. Now, there's two things about this particular subject. First off, the word soul from the Hebrew is nefesh. Of course, you know that. Yeah. All right. It's the breathing of the spirit that brings life. And the second thing is, it depends on the translation you're using. If you're using mine, I do not think I translate it that way. I find in a lot of that early literature, when especially when Gentiles get a hold of texts like that, they kind of mold them to their own Greek-Roman thinking in that respect. Um, and I don't think that the words that are written down in those speeches are literally the words of Peter or Simon Magus or the rest of it. It's got a different purpose than that. It's got a purpose of teaching. Like the Acts of the Apostles is not a history, history per se, at least not up until uh, 16 chapters are done, but it is a salvation history. It tells us how the Spirit began to move with a few people and the Spirit went forth to other types of people like the eunuch women, Ephesians, Samaritans, and finally, at the end of the book, the Spirit moves out into the whole world. That's what I call a salvation history rather than a, a 
a factual history. And it's the same way with the Nazarene Acts, the Clementines. The, they are, they're novelistic, but they do include some actual beliefs and practices of the earliest apostles. And that's just not my thought. That's the thought of some of the scholars that I follow. As far as Peter thinking there's an immortal soul, I believe that when I translated that, I didn't translate it that way. Because I thought, well, this flies in the face of everything that we believe in regards to, like you said, death, second death. Uh, I don't believe in soul sleep. I don't believe in an intermediary state. That is for people who are not born of the Spirit. It's different for people who are born of the Spirit. Because once they're born of the Spirit, the Spirit can die. And the Spirit is what is used to bring forth the people for uh, future work once they die in the flesh, in the millennium or whatever else is going to need to be done in order for Yahshua to turn this world over to his Father perfected. Uh, I don't believe that Peter believed in the eternal soul. Certainly they did in Greek literature. Uh, the philosopher Aristotle wrote a long treatise on this very subject called De Anima, which means on the soul. So there you have my understanding of it. And if it was in my translation like that, I would have changed it. I wouldn't have cheated in changing it. I would look to the actual words and see what they said. What I used was the earliest version of the, uh, the recognitions is in Latin. And it was done by Rufinus back in, I don't know, about the 4th, 5th century. And he's a pretty honest guy when it comes to these kind of things. But the homilies... Their original was in Aramaic, so they're a little different there. Uh, however, I'm with you on that, with the exception of the idea of the spirit, because I don't believe there's a spirit in animals, and I don't believe there's a spirit in, in natural-born humans, that they have to acquire that through, uh, through their being born again. But otherwise than that, I think we're both on the same level here. Okay, well... Like I said, uh, you know, I didn't, I certainly don't want to debate it, so uh, I'll agree to disagree on that. But I do uh, want to ask you, what do you believe, based on what you, or, or maybe you don't have an opinion, and that's perfectly okay too, uh, what do you believe happens to saved believers now when they die? So people who are born of the Spirit, do they go somewhere or what? Okay. I believe, and I would use a text, John chapter 5, verses 19 and following. It says that the people who are born again don't die, number one. Yeah, their flesh falls off, but they continue on because they were spiritually reborn. And the spirit is the, the fourth dimensional part of a person that allows them to interact in third dimension or fourth dimension. Those that are saved, they, well, I should say that hope for salvation, that are born again, they continue on. And they go into the timeless realm where we don't know what's going on, but there's a lot of speculation. Second, it says that, Yahshua says that those that do good, they'll live. So they'll be resurrected and they'll have a chance for life, especially if they never had a chance to know Yahshua before or anything about that. We're talking about billions and billions of people who have come and gone that certain groups relegated to hell that are supposed to be in hell right now, roiling around, uh, those people that did good will be resurrected in the flesh and have an opportunity to live in this new world that is ruled by the Master, and have the opportunity to accept that and to be born again. Then there's a third class in here, and it says that those who have done evil, they go to a trial. Creases is the word. You look at your King James Version, King James has damnation in there. And the word behind that, crisis, does not mean damnation or even judgment. It means a trial. And so when those people are resurrected, the way I understand it, is they're going to be judged for their evil, for their sins. And I think the adjudication is going to be such that the judge will know everything about that person's case, everything from their childhood on and be able to render right and equitable justice. And for those that have done evil, that the judge considers there is a possibility for rehabilitation, they will get that opportunity for rehabilitation. But those that have no uh, 
no desire to rehabilitate. They're just going to be annihilated, thrown in the lake of fire, annihilated. Throwing in the lake of fire is like a, a euphemism for, for annihilation. So that's what I see. I see three classes there. You can look that up and see for yourself. I think you'll be convinced. But ever since I found that passage, John 5, 19 and following, and translated that from the original language, I have believed in these three classes. And it seems to me like it works out very good that way, because we do know that there's going to be a resurrection. All dead everywhere are going to be resurrected. All dead everywhere in the resurrection are going to, through Yeshua, bow their heads to the Father and give him glory, according to Philippians 2. And that's the way it rolls for me. What that does for people who have lost loved ones and have been told that their loved one is um, on the spit in hell, <laughs> these, these uh, especially the women, they're very sensitive about their children going to hell. And they've yeah. been told that their child, who was maybe on the wrong path, are in hell right now. They're going to be there for eternity. But that's just not the case, and that's not even biblical. They're going to be resurrected, adjudicated, and they're going to get what they deserve, one way or the other. You know, uh, I don't speak um, to the point of knowing what God knows in his entirety, and I certainly don't claim that I, you know, have an infallible interpretation of anything. Well, but you're quite astute. If I could just ask a question to, you know, most of Christianity, and I'm talking, you know, I'm talking about most Christians in the world mm -hmm. um, who believe that, you know, if you die, you immediately go to heaven or hell, or if you die and you're lost, you you go to a place of torment in Hades or Sheol or whatever they want to call it. Um, one thing I don't understand is if, if you listen to what most Christians preach today, what I'm about to say, I believe, is what they're saying, and what it, it doesn't make sense to me. What they say is, you die, you lost, you go to hell, you're going to burn until the resurrection of the unjust, then you're going to be resurrected, come back into your body, then you're going to be judged, even though you've already been burning, and, and then you're going to be thrown back into like a permanent exactly. hell, and then you're going to burn forever. I'm like, exactly. what? Exactly. That doesn't make me any that? sense at all. Let's get them out of hell, judge them, and throw them back in. That's, I think that's the fly in the ointment of that kind of idea, certainly. You know, that you just die, you're going to go one place or the other. That's what they call it, is the first death. Otherwise, if they went to hell, they'd have never died. That's life. They're conscious in hell. They're rolling around there. They're having parties with their friends. That's not death. I've, uh, I've seen testimonies. Um, uh, just, you know, sometimes I click on them just out of curiosity on YouTube. I don't I'm not, not that I'm investing in it or giving credence to it, but, you know, I, I hear these testimonies from people who said that they've died and gone to hell, and, oh. you know, they come back with these, they, they come back with these descriptions of people being in cages on fire, mm -hmm. tortured by demons, and I'm like, where, 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 where in the Bible does it say any of that? Not only that, but I would be willing to bet that if you were to take every account of people who claim they've been to hell, no two are going to match up exactly. Two texts that were very important in the early church, church, I'm talking about the Gentile church, were the Apocalypses of Peter and the Apocalypses of Paul. They were very influential, and in those two texts, and I have them up there at YouTube, hell has all these different levels, and Peter and Paul have their own visions of hell, and of course people are strung up, heads uh, down in the muck of excrement, some are being whipped eternally. Those texts were very influential, and they actually undoubtedly inspired Dante Alighieri to write what he wrote about the journey through hell. And what I think happens to these people that see these things, if they even do, I doubt that some of them are even telling the truth. When you have a near-death experience, your brain shoots out all kinds of encephalins, endorphins, morphine-like substances, even if you're unconscious, you're going to see visions. You're going to have dreamy kind of visions, the content of which are going to depend on what you believe. You know where you're at. You know that you're in between life and death here. And I think that these are just figments of these people's imaginations or their brains on dope. You have been listening to Jackson Snyder Presents on Hebrew Nation Radio. 
Could you explain how it works? Sure can. You don't have any place to go on Shabbat to fulfill the commandment for a holy convocation. Come join us online every Shabbat at 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time. Download and install the client from zoom.us. And when the time comes, just surf to www.theyahad.com. It's that easy. You can be anonymous if you want to. You're going to hear a great liturgy and an even greater sermon every week. Pretty soon you'll get to know the people that come, and you'll feel good knowing that you worshipped on Shabbat with other like-minded believers. You're invited. Download and install the Zoom meeting client from zoom.us, and then surf to theyahad.com. See you there! You know where you're at. You know that you're in between life and death here. And I think that these are just figments of these people's imaginations or their brains on dope. Their brains on dope. Just put it that way, don't you? Uh, yeah, um, I heard. Now, I know that Seventh-day Adventism is not popular with a lot of people, but I have, you know, I've found that uh, everything they say, I'm not, I don't agree with everything that they say, but a lot of their pastors, they at least try to make some sense of yeah. what they read. And I remember a popular Seventh-day Adventist pastor named Doug Batchelor. He uh, he touched on this in one of his sermons, saying that when a person is close to death, uh, a lot of chemicals flood the brain to relieve stress, to put them at ease. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will describe the feeling afterward as feeling like they were floating or feeling like they yeah. were disconnected from themselves. Hey, I've been there. And, and, so, and some people that probably just it probably takes on a more extreme form, I would think, in some people. And especially if they, you know, if they have believed, well, even if they've been atheists, if, you know, they're confronted and they know consciously that, you know, they could slip away at any moment, you know, maybe there could be some trickery of the mind going on there and they could experience hallucinations of what they've heard everyone say that hell or heaven is like. Yeah. And, you know, I don't, I don't really put too much stock in that because the same dude, you know, he said that, um, you know, people from other countries and other religions see, may claim they see their gods when they have near-death experiences sure. like Vishnu in, yeah. in, in Hinduism. Yeah, uh, I went and had myself a stage one NDE in 2008, near-death experience. You know, I've got this cardiac problem, and there have been numerous times that I've had to call the EMTs to come get me and take me in. Well, this one time, they were taking me out in a gurney out of my house, and the gurney got caught up in the door. It wedged itself in there, and they couldn't get it out. The EMTs tried it where they could, and one of them, of course, monitors you while the other is working on getting you where you're going. And the one that was monitoring me started yelling at me, you're dying, you're dying, you're dead, you're dead. And he said to the other guy, he's dead. Don't worry about it now. We can do it another way. And I was conscious, and I felt like, well, that's okay. I felt higher than a kite. I felt wonderful. And I thought, how can I be dead when I feel like this? So that was my stage one, and I have no doubt that it was these endorphins floating around in my brain giving me that kind of feeling, because it was a morphine-like feeling. Now, I don't know what happens to these other people that go to heaven and hell, but I do know the first stage of that, and I have no doubt that it was natural chemicals that shot out in my brain and gave me the feeling like everything was going to be all right. I felt fine. Yeah, um, somewhat. Uh, the same pastor who uh, made reference to these near-death experiences said that, uh, you know, if you really think about it, that's a wonderful thing that God did for humanity that when you're under such a stressful situation that you have these chemicals mm -hmm. that can flood your brain and give you peace, even in, you know, if you are, if you are about to die and if you are about to slip away, that you can have a sense of peace right before you yeah. do. I tell people this very thing, especially when they are older and they begin to really be interested in what happens and they're afraid that in, in the onset of their death, they're going to be in horrible pain. Well, this is another piece of good news, and I, I'm like you. I feel like this is a built-in mechanism from Elohim that allows a person to escape the pain, or at least most of the pain, of death when these chemicals shoot in at the time when the body is stressed like that. Is that what you think? 
Yeah, um, I, I think I would tend to agree with that. There are a couple more things, if you don't mind, that I would like to just ask your opinion on. And, you know, you don't have to get too far into it if you don't want to. But uh, if you want to, that's totally up to you. But uh, I won't even mention them unless you give me the permission to go ahead and do something. Oh, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, Now, I'm going to reference a text that is well known, and many people believe it and consider it inspired or scriptural. But um, I would say, personally, if we consider this text that I'm going to mention to be scriptural or to be inspired then it kind of throws a monkey wrench in what we believe happens to people when they die, sure. at least the unsaved. And that book is the Book of Enoch. Because in the Book of Enoch, Enoch is taken on a journey through the afterlife. He, you know, he, he doesn't, I don't think it's called Sheol, but he says that he's taken to a mountain, I think. Yeah, all And kinds in of the places. mountain are hollow places. Uh -huh. And the angel tells him that these places have been prepared so that the spirits of the souls of men should be gathered herein, and, you know, it has the righteous separated from the wicked, and then it has another place specifically for the angels that send, and the the voice of Abel, it's, you know, th there's a voice crying out and making suit to heaven, and Enoch, Enoch asks the angel, you know, whose voice is this that I hear going forth to heaven? And the angel says, that's the spirit that went forth from Abel, and he is making suit to heaven, against Cain and against his seed until Cain's seed is destroyed from the face of the earth. And the book of Enoch, we know the book of Enoch is referenced in Jude, um, and a lot of people do believe that the apostles believed it, and then some people say Jesus believed it. Um, I don't see that the book of Enoch necessarily uh, matches up with what we have in the Hebrew Bible, yeah. I mean consistently throughout the Hebrew Bible, but even if I'm wrong, if the book of Enoch is inspired, if it is true, then it would seem to indicate that, you know, even for the wicked, there's consciousness after death. So I just wanted to get your opinion yeah. on this and find out where you stand. That's very good. Uh, what I think here is, first of all, you know, I spent a lot of time on Enoch and I translated it out of the gay ass so I could see what was going on there. But one thing that I learned about it is that it's a composite document. That is to say, there are at least five hands in there, and at least five separate and distinct books that sometime they put them all together and called it First Enoch. When Jude quotes Enoch, he's quoting the first book, the early book that talks about the Watchers and so forth, right at the beginning. Right. Uh, and the Assumption of Moses, same thing. He's not talking about the rest of them. The rest of them have that doctrine of all these places where souls go and everything. He's only talking about first book of Enoch, first part. There's five books in there. He only references the first book, which doesn't have anything like that in it. It's so did the apostles believe in the, you said the assumption of Moses, um, when it talks about, you know, the devil was disputing with, uh, you know, Michael the archangel disputed with the devil over the body of Moses, uh, the apostles, they believed that Moses was resurrected? <laughs> Who can say what they believe? We don't know what they believe. All we know is that that assumption of Moses is an ancient text. We don't have it anymore, to my knowledge. We don't know what it says other than one short quote out of it. Whether they believed in the rest of Enoch or not, or the assumption of Moses, I would say probably not, because as you said, uh, it doesn't go along with New Testament teaching of Yahshua. Now, remember that the Old Testament and the New Testament have very different ways of understanding the afterlife. However, what I do believe is true is that these hollow places, these spaces, these heavens were set apart, some for fallen angels, some for Giberim, according to Second Enoch, that is the offspring of Nephilim and women. And I believe that that's a, a place of entrapment for these terrible powers that would uh, destroy us completely. And I think in Revelation it talks about that pit being open, and certainly it's open in our day. But as for the rest of the Book of Enoch, I, I don't agree with it. <laughs> I, I promote it, and I don't agree with that. But I do agree with the first part concerning the fall of angels and their mixing up with humans. Now that's what the first book is all about. First Enoch, again, is a composite of at least five books and a whole bunch of scraps of other books all packed into one. And they they are not in consistency with each other. 
all the time, and certainly not with the scripture. We also have to remember that there were more than one type of Judaism, even back at that time. You know, when it, in the time of Yahshua, it is said that there were 120 different types of Judaism, and the writer Ep- Epiphanius, he tells us each one of them. I think he's from 4th or 5th century too. He tells us about each one of them. It wasn't a homogenous movement. They didn't all believe the same thing any more than uh, Baptist and uh, a Seventh-day Adventist believe, although they're pretty close. But as far as the afterlife, same thing. They all didn't believe like that. You know, like the Sadducees didn't believe any afterlife at all. The Pharisees yep. did believe in resurrection, which they brought over from Persia. You know, they were foreigners. And today, we all have a different opinion. We've shared two different opinions right now. And so that's the way it is. We can't apply those texts, or really any of them, to all people of that faith. That's how I feel right. about it. Um, now, so do, do you believe that, so in the book of Enoch it says that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that the giants that were produced from the union between angels and women, um, that since they were born of the flesh and of the spirit, that is, they were fathered by angels, but they're, you know, mothered by humans, when the fleshly part died, the angelic part still remained, and it said they would be called evil spirits in the earth. Yes. Do you believe that's where demons came from? Yes, I believe that that's one place, definitely. I mean, the reason I believe this mythology is because there's really no better or stronger explanation for why bad things happen to good people. That's the best explanation that I know of. And today, we know that we're living in a demon-filled world. Look at our government. We have lots and lots of sacks of skin and bones with a demon living inside of them, and big ones. So I don't have any problem with that at all, because it's the best explanation. But I don't preclude a better explanation for the source of evil that it might come along. The Old Testament doesn't really talk about evil spirits much, just a few kinds yeah. of evil spirits. Yeah, it's really interesting he, that when the Old Testament does mention evil spirits, like uh, the evil spirit that troubled Saul after the Spirit of God departed from him, uh, they said it was an evil spirit from the Lord. And it's really interesting, I think, that denotes that, you know, these spirits were fully under God's control. Yes. And what's also really interesting is that Satan, as Satan, as the words Satan appears in the Old Testament, whether it's referring always to a single being or not, because it means you know, adversary or right. opposer. Um, whenever Satan is in the Old Testament depicted, it's interesting, he's always doing exactly what God told him to do. Like in the book of Job, he did what God told him to do. And I think uh, I think there's a reference, I'm, I could have the reference wrong, but I think there, in one of the books of Samuel, there's an account that is uh, paralleled in another text in one text, it said that God incited David to do something, yeah. I think, to count to count Israel. And in the other text, it says that Satan enticed him. And that's one reason that Jews today believe that Satan is a divine tempter and not a rebellious angel, because they, you know, Jew, Jews today completely reject the notion that angels can even sin. They don't believe that they have free will. Um, of course, you know, you go into the New Testament, if you, if you take the New Testament at its word, it doesn't seem to support that at all. It depends on what type of Jew they were. Of course, the Jews that we have today came out of Phariseeism and modified themselves in numerous ways. Depends on what kind of Jew. You've got all these books that were found in the Dead Sea. Most or Many of them are apocalypses. And they show a whole different way of thinking, the Jubilees, Enoch, several other ones, that was rejected by the Pharisees. That's why those books are in your Bible, because the Pharisees reject that kind of eschatology. And uh, if we hadn't have found that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, to learn that there were sects of Jews that definitely believed in that particular fall or that uh, origin of evil, then... It just depends on who's believing it, what sect it is. Same today. And Jews of today, you say that Satan is totally under the control of Yahweh. And I can see that because that's pretty much what the Old Testament teaches. Because Yahweh sends evil spirits 
and Satan sends evil spirits. And if that's not a contradiction, what it what it does is it shows us that there were two different hands in that. You know about the source theory? The source theory? Yeah, the four sources. No, I'm not familiar with okay, that. Okay, look up the, here's a term for you, documentation hypothesis. This is what is believed now in regards to the Tanakh, and especially the Torah, that there were at least four hands in there, and you can separate the hands out as to what words they use for the deity. There's a priestly source, there's a Yahwist source, there's an Elohist source, and there's a Deuteronomist source. That's the four main ones. And if you look that documentary hypothesis up, you'll find that it pretty well ex explains those kinds of contradictions. And I, I agree with that. There's more than one hand in there, and in the course of the ages that that thing has been around, there's been a lot of hands. In well, um, I would have to say, just for the record, so because I don't want anyone to say that I never said it, um, without you know, without disagreeing or agreeing, I will say that I do believe that the Hebrew Bible, in as far as we can translate it correctly, I do believe that the most original texts that you can get, if we do have the original texts, are completely inspired uh, by God. I do believe it is the Word of God. Now, in addition to that, I would like to ask you, um, because, you know, there are a lot of people that are, I think, uh, divided on this uh, issue, too, and I think this issue definitely came up uh, in the Hebrew Roots movement among a lot of people, and uh, I don't know if you ever touched on it. I know David touched on it at one point, but uh, do you believe that the Apostle Paul was a genuine apostle or a false apostle. Everything that he said wasn't contradictory to the Gospels, right. but uh, a lot of people think that, you know, the Apostle Paul was, uh, his message was really opposed by the earliest first Christians, and they say there's evidence in some of the, like, the Ebionite writings that they rejected him, yeah. and things like that, so. There's a book that I have called The Opposition to Paul in the Early Messianic Movement. Paul, in a way, he's misunderstood. I have another, I gotta tell you about these reference books. It's called The Authentic Letters of Paul. Scholars from the Jesus Seminar, they went through Paul and they took out the books that aren't from Paul. You know, six of them he didn't write. And they went into the books that he did write and they took out the interpolations. They took them all out, all the editions that were put in there by other people. So what we have is a new translation of Paul without the crap mixed in, if you excuse my expression. And when you read Paul that way, then you can see that a good bit of the stuff that people have a problem with him about, he never wrote in the first place. But there are things that we need from Paul, like the, the theology of resurrection, the charismata gifts, um, resurrection, charismata gifts, uh, the motivational gifts in Romans 12, a lot of things like that we need. Also, the history that Paul has in mentioning the names of different other people there, we know who those are. And the second thing about Paul, what I have a problem with, is that in order to keep his movement out of trouble in Europe, there were certain laws there that are anti-Torah that he had to keep, or his, his entire movement would be destroyed. He was close to the imperial family. His good friend was Seneca, who was the, he was the governor of Nero. When I say that, what do I mean? I mean, he gave Nero his education. Paul has several letters that are going to Seneca. And so with those letters, if they're authentic, then Paul was very close to the imperial crowd. He was also close to the Herodian crowd because he was a Herodian. He's like the great grandson of Shalome, that Shalom, Shalome that was me, uh, sister of Herod the Great. So he's got a lot to lose when he goes to Europe. He can get away with stuff down in Syria and places, but when he gets up in Europe, gets to Rome, Macedonia, Greece, Achaia, and he's preaching these things, he has to preach. Women keep quiet because women were not allowed at that time to run any kind of meetings unless they had their man there, the man that they were under. Women were all assigned a man. So Paul has to say that. Paul also, in First Peter, which I believe is just as Pauline as any other book in the New Testament, says, obey the emperor. When we see him in the Acts saying, we 
we better to to uh, obey God than man. Some of these things he had to say in order to keep out of trouble. Same with circumcision. It was a capital crime up in Europe to circumcise somebody. That was considered mutilization, mutilation of the genitals. There was a law called the Lex Cornelia that made doing a circumcision illegal. If Paul was going to go up there to Europe, he has to fight with the apostles about these particular matters because he's going to have to obey their law up there since he was a Herodian close to the imperial family. He's got to stay out of trouble. And I think instead of the Lord telling him to do this and that, I think he just made his choice not to break the law up there and stay out of trouble. We don't know that Paul was martyred. We don't know that. We don't know what happened to him. We think that he went to Britain and Spain. There are texts that tell about that. He might have settled in Britain. I don't know. But there, what we know about Paul's martyrdom is just hearsay written hundreds of years after him, in one source. So that's, I'll just recap this by saying, Paul, he's going to go to Europe. He needs to be a little more conscious of the laws that were there, because some of those laws were anti-Torah. So he gets rid of those parts of the Torah. He has a revelation. He gets rid of them, and then he succeeds up there to some extent. There are things we need him for. There are things we don't need him for. My opinion is that he he's letters, at least the authentic ones, should have been put in a separate volume as commentaries. But what he has, some of what he has, is very necessary for us to even know how to pronounce the Master's name, because Paul tells us how to do that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2. Okay, that's all I got to say about that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I understand, well, I understand where you're coming from, definitely. Um, I just wanted to know where you stood on it. Where do you stand on it? Were, Huh? Where do you stand? And I know uh, Brad Brank, David Hanatsari is completely anti-Paul, but then again, he's anti a lot of things. I say that some of Paul needs to be thrown out, and some of it needs to be capped. Uh, I'll put it this way, um, and I'm just being completely honest with you here. Sure. Um, I am not. I am not yet knowledgeable sufficiently on a lot of certainly the New Testament. Just really scripture in, in entirety. I'm still, I, I'm one of those people who I have a, I have a couple of topics that I think I know well. Yeah. But every so often, you know, I'll find out that maybe I don't know it as well as I thought I did and I need to remain humble. So I'll put it like this. I'm not a scholar and I am not a, you know, a Bible commentator. And a lot of this stuff I haven't really researched in depth. And a lot of it I've learned just from watching presentations that people have right. been kind enough to put up like you and like David and like a lot of other people in the Hebrew roots and out of the Hebrew roots. Um, my opinion is that I don't know enough about it yet to have a certifiable, credible opinion, at least on Paul and even on a lot of the New Testament. But um, the only reason I am uh, kind of staunch about the state of the dead about what happens when, it, when a person dies is because uh, that's one topic that I've spent a lot of time on and that I think I got to know pretty well. But um, I mean, even on that, I don't claim, of course, that I have all the answers. So I want to remain humble mm -hmm. and, you know, able to look at things from other points of view. Well, my and opinion is that public information as it comes. My, uh, that's right. You've got to write your doctrine in pencil and eraser. That's all the time we have today. But we'll take this subject up again tomorrow night, and to fill out the episode, I will read you excerpts of the book I mentioned, The Authentic Paul, or The Authentic Letters of Paul, and you'll see yourself how when Paul's letters are cleaned up, they're a lot less confusing, and you have a lot less to disagree with as well. That's next time, my friends, tomorrow night. If you'd like to contact us, please do right here at Yahad Headquarters in Vero Beach, 321-421-9266. Let's just have a little talk. Wouldn't that be fun? Without further ado, we wish you good evening. So long to you, my brother. So long to you, my sister. In the name of Yahshua. I wish you well.
Bukan. 